Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. We've been having a little fun in behind the, the scenes. <laughs> and it's all Donna's fault. I cannot. It is. <laughs> it is. I take the blame. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. We're so glad you're here today. My goodness gracious, we've got a superstar on today. Yes, and I've do. got the I've got the picture here right behind me. And let me reduce this a little bit. And what do I need to do? Let's see, I need to I need to duck, right? Pretty much. <laughs> there he is. There is our guest today, Sergeant Stubby. 1916 to 1926. Mm -hmm. What a tremendous story this little mutt dog had serving in World War I and was wounded several times and I helped guess. save, yeah. Hundreds, yeah. Yeah. hundreds of lives. Yes, yes. I mean, just a true little, you know, just a great little hero. But we'll be right back and we're going to tell you the story of Sergeant Stubby. And we're going to have some fun because when it comes to Four Paws, they are the biggest guests that you can have on any show. And we'll be, you bet, and we'll be right back right after this brief message from our sponsor. Hi, and welcome to the Messages of Inspiration and Hope show that's proudly sponsored by the Six Minute Webinar. Today, we have some exciting and very interesting guests, real people just like you and me. Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy the show. Now, here's Jim. I'm going to have to tease Charlene a little bit, you know, because dogs are people. I mean, they're part of your family. My yeah. goodness gracious. Um, we, we started uh, thinking about doing a special show, and I don't know how the dog thing came up, but we just both, just, that's it. That's what yeah. we need to do because there's so many uh, wonderful stories about animals and dogs in particular, uh, how they, uh, you know, what they will do for their, for their family, for their masters. I mean, my oh. goodness gracious. If, you yeah. know, go ahead. Donna. Forever. Well, I mean, it, it just goes from little teeny dogs to big, giant, huge dogs, you know, and oh, yeah. it's all about their heart. Mm, that's exactly what I was going to say. Can you imagine what a wonderful world this place would be if everyone had the heart of a dog? You Absolutely. think about that. You think about that. My goodness gracious. And, you know. A few weeks ago, we had Rennie um, Gabriel on the show, and one of his charities that he loves is called Shelter to Soldier, and I was unaware of it. And what the uh, this is a nonprofit organization, and they save not one, but two lives. Uh. And Donna. I imagine it's really something to see them go into a animal shelter and rescue certain dogs, medium to large sized dogs that can be service dogs right. and train. It takes about a year to a year and a half to train these dogs. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're trained just like seeing eye dogs. They got to have a certain mm -hmm. personality, a certain temperament, and they know how to select the, the right dogs for this. But, my goodness gracious, when you think of a service dog or something like that, you're thinking of, you know, a seeing eye dog or something. And but what they do with these dogs here is off the chart, isn't it? It is. Well, and, and anymore, the beautiful thing is, as, as just like dogs have evolved from millions of years ago. So have we in what they can do as a service dog. Mm -hmm. So not only, you know, I mean, the, the multitude of things that a, a dog can sense and be a service dog for is just, it's huge. There's, you know, people, of course, who can't see. There's people who are epileptic, who, you know, PTSD, uh, which is what this does, helps the soldiers, helps calm them. I mean, they'll, they'll get up and hug them. The dogs will get up and hug them or lay on their lap. And, and give them that calmness 
to help get through that anxiety, that PTSD. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because dogs have that special sense that they mm -hmm. can pick up on that. And in the shelter to service, uh, excuse me, shelter to soldier, the shelter to show, get my tongue going here, shelter to soldier.org is their website. And they bring these dogs in after they're trained and they're given to one soldier that is suffering from PTSD or any type of uh, traumatic brain injuries. Uh, they call them TBIs uh, or, you know, the uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a very serious brain disease. I'm very familiar yeah. with that one. We lost uh, we lost an individual in our family to suicide because of that one. But <clears throat> because every day. Here in this country, over 1,800 dogs are done away with. Yep. And what's really amazing is that every 69 minutes, a U.S. veteran commits suicide. Mm -hmm. So when they get the dogs and train them to be sensitive to PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, you know, just anything like that, right. and they give the dog to the soldier guess how many soldiers have committed suicide none you got it zero and that makes that wonderful program all so special and i tip my hat to them again ladies and gentlemen it's shelter to soldier.org is their website and this little guy we're going to be talking about today sergeant stubby he had very he had a very humble beginning too, didn't he? Oh, he, he was very humble beginning. And he ended up, you know, quite the bona fide hero in about every aspect you can think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they estimated he was born about 1916 and uh some say he was kind of like a, a, a bull, an American bull terror. A, bull terrier and others say more like a Boston terrier or could have been a, a mutt between the two or whatever. But he was just wandering around there close to the soldiers. And uh, he was at the uh, uh, university there at New Haven, uh, Connecticut. And what happened was, you know, this one soldier uh, kind of liked the dog, fed him a little bit. And <laughs> it, it's kind of amazing because he, when they got ready to leave, the soldier was part of, I'm trying to think of the unit he was part of, the 102nd Infantry, if I remember correctly. 102nd, yes, it was 102nd. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. And they got ready to ship off. And it surprised me when I read that the little dog saluted, I don't know how he did it, <laughs> the commanding officer. And the commanding officer said, okay, put him in your bag, take him with you. And he went off to war. <laughs> Right. Well, he, he was so fond of Corporal James Robert Conroy, his mm -hmm. owner, that he followed him. And when he would go out and, and do drills, the dog would go out and do drills. So when, mm -hmm. you know, the soldiers would march and then stop, the little dog would stop. And so he, this dog was so daggum smart that he, you know, he watched him giving salute. And I'm assuming just brought his little foot up as high as he could and kind of did the salute at the same time. Oh yeah. I would love to have seen that. Right. And yeah. And the little dog, he ships off with them. And of course now being soldiers, I, I've been, a, you know, I've been a soldier and I, when I went to Vietnam, I know what it's like when you're getting ready to shove off to go somewhere and you don't, you don't. Jim, you muted your mic. That's what I get for using my hands. <laughs> Talking with my hands up. Thank you, Donna. And it's really amazing because when you're go going off the war, you don't really know what you're going to walk in. Right. You know if you're going to come back. <laughs> That's another, you know, biggie. Right. But what's really get, uh, gets me is that the little dog, he shoves off with him and he is fondly loved. He becomes a celebrity afterwards. We're getting a little bit ahead of her. Let's go back and take him a little bit on the journey there, if we may. Uh, uh, he was a very unusual little dog, as we know, and he was promoted to the rank of sergeant. The only he, the dog that I know in the military, they got promoted. They may give him titles, but he was officially promoted. 
Right. He was. And he was actually, I have it in my notes. Mm -hmm. He was, um, if I can find it in the right, right order. Mm -hmm. he, here it is. Um, the reason he got promoted was now remember folks, this was during world war one. And so he found a German spy and the German spy tried to befriend the dog and Stubby would have none of it. I mean, he went nuts. He, he bit the guy on the leg. He knew he was the enemy of, of his, of his soldiers. And he barked and growled and pinned that, that German spy down until he raised enough noise that his soldiers came for him mm. and, got, and, and, you know, obtained and uh, got the German spy. So because mm. of that, the, uh, the capture, and I'm reading from my notes, he was promoted to the rank of sergeant. Now, Jim, I got to ask you, how long does it normally take to get promoted to that rank? Well, uh, I'm going to exclude myself because okay. it took me longer than most folks. <laughs> but uh, uh, you're talking, goodness, by the time you go from E1, when you enter the military, as far as the Army is concerned, that's what we're talking about here, uh, to E5, uh, goodness, it can take at least a minimum of about 18 months, roughly. Wow. Because it's not going to happen because you got to have time to season in the ranks. Right. To be, an e, be, a, be a private, then private first class, then be a specialist or E4, which is a uh, corporal rank before you become an NCO. You got to have some time to season and grow in the rank because uh, otherwise, you know, a person would be you, you do them an injustice, you know. Right. Right. It's kind of like taking an accountant and pointing, uh, promoting him up to be the CEO of a company. when he, He's got no people skills. He's an accountant, you know you'd be doing him a huge disservice. Absolutely. You know, the interesting thing when we were reading on this story is that he, Stubby, got used to gunfire mm. and got used to the noise and the, the shelling and the incredible amount of, of, you know, noise that these guys had in the trenches. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mortar going off all around him and he just mm -hmm. took it in stride. Yeah, he did because uh, world war one was a trench war, right? The guys were in trenches on both sides yeah. and little stubby. He served with the 102nd infantry uh, regiment and he was in the trenches in France for mm -hmm. 18 months. And he participated in four different offensive offenses that they call them, which is, you know, maneuvers. And he was involved. He was in 17 battles because most dogs are here, a shotgun or something like that, and they'll take off. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting because in his uh, first year of battle, Stubby was injured by mustard gas. So mm -hmm. after, because that was, you know, if, if you know your history, that was a biggie that the German army used against everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so after he recovered, he re returned um, back to his unit. But the thing of it is, is that he was extremely sensitive to minute amounts of gas from that time forward. Mm -hmm. So in the trenches, because of course we all know that a dog has, you know, a, a smelling that's, you know, hundreds of times better than ours. And he would smell that mustard gas coming. And there was a morning that it was an early morning, what they call early morning mustard gas raid. And mm -hmm. probably early, I'm saying probably about three o'clock in the morning. And this dog went ballistic. He barked and went up and down the line in the trenches, waking up all the soldiers, literally saving their lives from being, you know, bombarded with this mustard gas. He sure was. And uh, because he was familiar what was a danger to him and what was a danger to his fellow soldiers, because that was his family. Right. And that's one thing. That's one thing about dogs is that um, whenever a dog is uh, rescued from a shelter or adopted from a shelter, I should say, and they knew or they remember what their life was like. Mm -hmm. And then they come home to someone that loves them and treats them like family. I mean, they're more appreciative of it. Mm -hmm. 
and they are, uh, you know, they're they're super protective of their family. They want to make sure that this doesn't go away because this is a good thing. And you mentioned that about him being in and and the mustard gas and all that. I was reading my notes uh, just very briefly here about it. He entered combat on February the fifth, nineteen eighteen, and he was under constant fire day and mm -hmm. night for over a month. And we worry about, you know. Our soldiers today, with that type of bombardment, uh, in World War One, they came out with shell shock, right. which was the big, big word for words for PTSD. And goodness, I mean, in April of 1918, uh, during a raid, uh, he got wounded in the foreleg mm -hmm. and, uh, and from the from the grenades from the Germans. I mean, so he was a wounded little hero and he kept coming back and he kept coming back from all those mm -hmm. wounds. And Donna, my goodness gracious, I don't know. You know, this little dog had more guts than anything I've ever seen. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, he was, he was extremely, everything that we read, it was beautiful because, mm. you know, our, our show is called inspiration and hope, right? Mm -hmm. Well, inspiration and hope, comes in every level, everywhere around us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's exciting for us because this little dog not only inspired, but gave every one of those soldiers hope that they may not have had mm -hmm. during that time in their life. Showed them love and compassion too. I mean, just as a dog would. And when he got injured that time, I remember uh, reading about this. He was sent to the rear echelon mm -hmm. for, to recover, and he was in convalescence. And while he was there, he helped improve the morale of other soldiers that were wounded. I mean, right. you take like you take like if people go in and they take like a, a dog or a cat into a, um, a retirement home or nursing home or whatever it might be, it really improves the morale of the folks that's, you know, in there, in those kind of places, because there's not much going on in those places, except for they throw you out there like a flower pot in a wheelchair and let you look at TV all day. I mean, whew. right. That's got to be, you know, I'm not trying to be negative or anything, but I'm just saying that, you know, you feel sorry for people that's in a situation like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it was interesting because when he was wounded uh, mm. by the grenades, mm -hmm. um, he, it was in his little paw, and like you said, he went to to recover. Well, in the town they were at in France, the the women of the town got together and made him his little coat yeah. that you see on him behind Jim. Yeah, let me duck down again. Let you take a look at that, and because little uh, Sergeant Stubby here, he's the star of the show. Let me move this. Let's see, get that. There we go. Let me get out of the way here. So how beautiful is that, that, he, you know, the women in the town of uh, in France that they were in had heard of all he was doing to help prevail against the atrocity of, of evil that Hitler was bringing upon their town and wanted to do something to help this poor little dog who was mm -hmm. in there with everything. I mean, honestly, he was fighting just as hard as every man in his in the 102nd. Yeah. You think about all his early warnings and barkings and, uh, you know, it gave the soldiers also a sense of comfort. Right. Because, you know, it's just like if you're you're at home alone and you got your, you know, your dog with you, there is a sense of security that your dog will sense or hear something before you will. Right. And, and, and Donna, let's talk about your your little your little bitty baby boy. <laughs> <laughs> My little bitty horse. <laughs> Well, Can you ride little... him? Can you put a saddle <laughs> on him or ride him almost? Huh? almost. He's, a, he's a one of these. Uh, he's a great Pyrenees. Him. Yeah, he's a great Pyrenees. Uh, got a lot of husky in him. Uh, the only thing on the husky side you see is his tail. But he's four feet long. And he was the run of the litter. And he weighs about 90 pounds. And he is extremely, extremely protective of me. Um, he comes to the door with me. He, he'll he bark. Um, he will protect me at all costs. He, um, 
because of uh, one of my autoimmune diseases when uh, I lived in Ohio and I would get ready to have a seizure, he was um, always there right before it happened. Wow. He would always come up to me and lay his head on my shoulder right before I was getting ready to have a seizure. Wow. So, you know, heroes, even, even our dogs at home are, are a hero and they give us hope and they give us comfort. You know, when we don't feel good, they curl up with us. Uh, they follow mm -hmm. us. I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody out there who has a dog mm -hmm. has had some kind of a heroic story about their own canine. Oh yeah. I, uh, I had surgery back in, uh, oh, about 2013, 20, somewhere in there. And, uh, I came home. And my dog, he was an Australian cattle dog, a blue healer, and his name was oh. Range. And, uh, of course, when I get up in the morning after having surgery, uh, I always got to shower and, you know, shave and get cleaned up, you know, for my day. But the first few days there, uh, just getting up and, you know, showering and shaving, and getting dressed, uh, it was time for break time, to be honest oh, yeah. with you. Absolutely. And and uh, so I came out, you know, every day and after I had something to eat, maybe some toast or whatever. And uh, I'd lie down on my couch in the day room. And I never forget range came up to me and he sniffed the side of my face and he went down my body to about to my knee, came back and he was sniffing the area where I had surgery in my abdomen. And I mean, he spent quite a bit of time there. Like he was, you know, checking everything out. Right. And then it, then he came back up beside him, my face there, and he licked the side of my face, and he laid down beside me Aww. like everything's going to be all right. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you, I lost him to pneumonia, and it only took 48 hours from the time we, we knew he was sick till he was gone. Oh. And, oh, I'll be honest with you, folks, that stabbed me like a knife in the heart. And, you know, <laughs> I've told many people about that, and – yeah, it was really, really hard. It's real hard to dig a grave with tears in your eyes, you know. Right. It really is. And I mean, because they're, they're so special to us and they're just, uh, they become such a, an important part of our lives. And when you think about these soldiers and little Sergeant Stubby, um, I think that he got, uh, you, I think he already covered this. He, he got uh, promoted to uh, Sergeant. Uh, whenever he uh, so he was solely responsible for Captain that German spy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, humans smell like humans, but then there he knew that was the enemy. Right. He just knew that. <laughs> and, well, and, and that's and, and he also because because everyone spoke English around him, and of course mm -hmm. the, the Germans were speaking German. He was smart enough to be able to differentiate that mm -hmm. one was good and one was not good. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I remember in Vietnam, uh, we had the guys that were part of the canine uh, group there, the tunnel rats and stuff, and they had their dogs with them. And one guy told me, he says, my dog can smell any, anything. And he's, you know, like I would go over there and the dog first time he saw me didn't pay me any attention. Because he knew I was one of the good guys on right. his team, but if someone out, one of if one of the enemies came over, or if we if they were walking past, you know, and the hand, and the hands tied tied him back, they'd have to hold him because he would want to go after him. <laughs> right. I mean, he did not play around. He he was serious. Mm -hmm. And you know what's really amazing too. I want to get into this too a little bit about when he came back. Oh. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a little dog who went to war and he was it's, just initially he, just. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, Initially, he was just going over because this little uh, private, whatever he was, he snuck him into the bag. And, you know, the commanding officer, well, he saluted me. OK, you can have him, you know, whatever. And that was they did not know that this little dog was going to literally earn his stripes. Right. He get promoted as a sergeant. And then when he came home, he was the star. He was a celebrity. They made a mo an animated movie af after him. Uh, he, go ahead. He, well, he, he didn't. 
I mean, of course, he helped all the men there in, in mm -hmm. France in, in his regiment. But when he came home, he helped bring, if, if there can be that aspect of war, um, a really beautiful aspect of war, mm -hmm. where he gave his heart saving the men from mustard gas from because he would hear the whine of of the shells coming in long before the men could hear it mm. so that was another thing he would bark oh. and and let them know that there was incoming before they could even hear the incoming mm. shells coming in and, and so that's then, go ahead i just gonna say and that's very very important because <laughs> like uh you know you've only got seconds maybe right. two or three seconds to respond. It's like in an ambush. I mean, four seconds into an ambush is a long time because you've either responded or you're dead. Right. <laughs> that's just the rules of role. I mean, that's just the way the world turns in, it, in that area. So Jim, tell us, uh, this is so cool. I, I love this story about Stubby. When hmm. he came home, um, tell <laughs> us about the presidents that he met. Oh, my goodness gracious. He not only met the president of the United States, he met presidents of the United States. He also, uh, he, he, the presidents that he met was President Woodrow Wilson. He met Calvin Coolidge and Warren G. Harding. Now, how many war heroes have met one U.S. president? How many have met two U.S. presidents, especially the rank of sergeant? How about three? I mean, that list gets narrowed in a hurry, <laughs> in a big hurry. And I got a kick out of him because he was also, <clears throat> he was such a celebrity. They had him marching in parades. He was leading parades. Right. I they mean, made him an honorary uh, lifetime mm -hmm. member of the American Legion and the YMCA. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that little dog came home and marched in all the parades for the American Legion, went to conventions, and mm. became one of their top recruiters for the American Legion. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I mean, you know, and just think this little dog that was found wandering around on this campus, and he was kind of a mutt, and he just, you know, this one soldier seemed to like him, and, you know, called him stubby because his body was kind of round and his legs were short and all that. But I mean, he was, he was quite the little dog. I remember that uh, reading um, and he also appeared on vaudeville stages mm -hmm. and they had the actor named there. I didn't know who he was. Stephen uh, P. Poli, P-O-L-I. Sylvester. Sylvester. Oh, Poli. Sylvester. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And he was awarded, you know, as you said, lifetime memberships there with the American Legion YMCA. But in 1921, the Journal of the Armies, John J. Pershing, he yes. presented a gold medal from the Humana Education Association to Stubby. And the subject of a famous photograph and other artistic media. My goodness gracious. This little dog was, you know, he really impressed a lot of people. He he saved a lot of lives. He he would, I don't know how many times he was wounded. Do you remember how many times he was wounded? I it was, he was wounded a total of three times. Mm -hmm. Three yeah, times. And I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, stomach and uh, leg wounds and all that. I mean, that's, that's major for a little pup. That's, well, that's major you, for us. <laughs> well, you consider, here's the thing. When you consider that he got wounded by the mustard gas. So as Ooh. bad as it is for humans, understand that here's, here's the issue that, that dogs and cats, um, any kind of animal that's lower to the ground have. First of all, their sense of smell is is hundreds of times uh, better than ours, mm -hmm. but their lungs are smaller, mm -hmm. so it goes into them a lot quicker. Oh yeah, right. And so, and it's harder for them to, you know, it's not like people where we can say, "Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't breathe. Something's wrong." You know, little guys are out there just, you know, trying to hang in there. So thank goodness that his his counterpart in two feet form of the soldiers were there to help him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because that mustard gas, that's bad stuff. That damages yes. your lungs yes. big time. 
And we're going to stop for just a few seconds. We're going to pay a little bill here with E360 TV. And uh, we'll be right back right after these words from my sponsor, the Six Minute Webinar. The Six Minute Webinar allows you to create a marketing product in a fraction of the time that it would typically take to create a webinar. And when you follow the simple process, you will provide laser-focused content to your ideal customers. And the nice thing is, it's repeatable for any product or service that you offer. My name is Rich Parsons, founder of Higher Calling Consulting, and creating my own six-minute webinars has allowed me to have a 24-7 marketing presence for my ideal clients. So I encourage you to make the six-minute webinar part of your business marketing strategy too. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you, it's it's really amazing uh, about the six minute webinar, what we do there. And uh, Donna, you're very familiar with it. And it, it, it helps us to be able to get our message across to our ideal client. Right. And, our precise <laughs> message. Yes. Yes. And actually, the, the way the whole thing came about was that we started out there in Phoenix on some training. And we didn't have that many people show up. So we wanted to do some specialized training. And we started giving people six minute talks on, on stage and to make sure we get everybody covered and all that. And then Stephanie Dwayne, she was there and I call her the Kaching lady. She told me, she says, when are you guys going to put on some more of that training? And we go, well, okay, we, we can, I guess, you know, this is how smart that I am. <laughs> She says, Jim, I, and she told Don, she says, I call that my personal ATM machine because her being a clinical hypnotist, she used to talk about, well, I help people, you know, lose weight, help people deal with anxiety, help people quit smoking, help them this, that, and the other. But six minute webinar, she just really got that thing going. And we really picked up on what she laid on the foundation, to be honest with you. And like the six minute webinar during this six minute webinar, I will show you three ways that you can lose weight. Boom. Right. That's it. And right there, your six minute webinar has accomplished two things. Number one, you have bounced everybody out. That's not a client. Right. You haven't wasted their time, but people who are interested in losing weight, maybe 10 pounds, whatever. They'll say, Hey, I'll see what this person's got for, see what they're going to say for six minutes. Right. And, uh, you know, Donna, I got, I've, I've been talking about the dog so much. I forgot to put up even your website there, young lady. <laughs> there we go. And that last name is, that's Donna Guinoa. It took me about three months, two weeks, and one day to learn how to pronounce that. He's still working on the spelling folks. Don't worry about it. <laughs> is that a, did I spell it right there? Oh, you did. I'm just teasing you. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, <laughs> And your website, of course, this is who you are. You are high energy right now. Oh, my yes. goodness. If, if you want some energy, you want some high energy. You want it right now, right? <laughs> right. You don't want it yesterday. You need it now. That's you know, right. Let's change your paradigms yeah. and live your yeah. best life. Oh, yeah. Uh, who sang that song, Running on Empty? Was that the, um, I'm trying to think, is that the Eagles? Whatever. Anyway, well, let's get back to our, our honored guests here, you know. Sergeant well, Stubby, because when it comes, go ahead, Donna. Well, I just wanted to say one of the beautiful things, um, Jim, that I love about, um, of course, any dog. I'm a huge animal lover, but dog is spelled God backwards. Wow. I hadn't thought about that, but that's right. And, you know, dogs like little scruffy or scrubby here had multitude of, of ways to help. He helped with the gas, you know, the gas getting lob. He helped mm -hmm. with the missiles coming in, but you know, mm -hmm. actually during his time in France, during world war one, he was also mm -hmm. a search and rescue dog. He, mm -hmm. would, he would listen for the sounds of again, English sounding soldiers. 
and it would mm -hmm. he would take them to him and he would go over there and he would bark if they couldn't get up if they weren't you know ambulatory and he would bark until they could come get the wounded soldier and take him back for help now if yes. they were wounded but kind of disoriented he would lead them back to where they would get medical treatment mm. That's really amazing. And it really, you know, when you think about that, Donna, that little dog, because of the just who he was, because, you know, you got to ask yourself, number one, where did dogs find the capacity to love? Right. You know, you think about that and their special little personality, every single animal on planet Earth, I don't care what it is. It yeah. each has its own little unique personality that makes it special. Yep. And, and Sergeant Stubby, uh, goodness gracious, he used his gifts, his talents, his abilities to help others in our hour of need. Now, what kind of a lesson is that, that for us today? Right. I mean, think about our gifts and our talents and our, you know, how we can help others, you know, in their hour of need, uh, you know, help them get from where they are to where they want to be. And because uh, so many people, they're only interested in butter and own bread. You know, I hate to say it like that, but you know what I mean? Right. Absolutely. It's true. And, you know, it doesn't even have to be a big thing. It can just be, you know, giving one of my favorite things is giving somebody a total stranger a smile. And even through the mask that, you know, we still have to wear, you can see the smile. Right. Oh, yeah. Because we don't know what somebody else is going through, Jim, right? Mm, no kidding. So no kidding. We have no idea the battles that they're facing. So that may be the only bright thing in their day is that smile that you give them. Mm -hmm. One of the things, too, during this day and time, especially since the pandemic hit us in 2020, we know how that affected us. But think of all the fear that people have yeah. lived in. Mm -hmm. And think how fear put stress on the body. It cripples and, you. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it gets ugly. <laughs> it can get mm -hmm. ugly in a hurry because I can get oh, yeah. stressed and I'll feel it in my mm -hmm. heart and stuff, you know, and uh, it's not a nice feeling, you know, and, yeah. but I mean, you know, whenever you, whenever you get stressed like that, so people who are in the life, they may be having a, you know, a camouflage, camouflage their face or something like that. Or if you say, how you doing Dave? Fine. They're just being a human parrot, you know, and, and you think about how this little dog demonstrated his love and all of this, you know, like I say, he earned his stripes. He was a subject. Yes, he, he earned his stripes and uh, goodness wounded three times. And I mean, he just kept, just kept on. He, he was, he was there for the duration of the war. He really was. Mm -hmm. And you, you think about all the hardships. I mean, if he wasn't a dedicated dog, he would just be like, I'm out of here. I mean, I, I survived on my own there in Connecticut for this guy adopted me and they took me over this foreign country. And now they got all these fireworks all the time. And goodness, I mean, cause no dog likes explosion because yeah. the sensitivity of ear and, but he was just, you know, a very special little uh, dog that came along and goodness, I, I, you know, being a dog lover, I mean, I love these kind of stories. I really do. I do too. Well, and he had no training. You know, he had no special right. training. Let's think about right. that for a minute. I mean, mm -hmm. today, um, you know, most dogs need training, right? Mm -hmm. And this old guy just was innately born with it and mm -hmm. had a heart of, of, is bigger than the, you know, the entire United States. Uh, oh, helping, yeah. so, helping so many people that, you know, no matter what was going on around him in war, he knew that his, his job was to protect those soldiers mm -hmm. and to help. And oh, yeah. you talk about inspiration, you talk about hope, you talk about, you talk about love. I mean, it's everything there is personified. Mm, absolutely. And we can all take a big lesson from that because you think about the esprit de corps. I mean, the mm -hmm. morale that this little dog, you know, built up and gave people hope, especially when he was back there at that hospital recovering from um, grenade wounds in his abdomen and his leg, one of his forelegs. And he's given the other wounded soldiers 
you know, encouragement. Mm -hmm. Wow. And sometimes in life, we're so busy, we can't even, you know, take time to even call someone or, or send them a text or something. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, Dr. George Grant. I sent him a, I, I, I think I said this on a previous show, but, and, and I send texts, uh, different texts to my friends and stuff like that, especially my guys I serve with, you know, and I'm fellows, you know. I'll say something like, hello there, you handsome rascal. How you doing today? You behave yourself. <laughs> Hope you have a good day, you know. And just a little light humor like that. Right. Because a lot of people, the only thing they send around is the the muck and the mire and the trash of life. They really yeah. do. I mean, goodness, who wants to, you know, hear all the stuff that's going on in our country as far as what the uh, the politicians are doing? Uh, they're not solving anything. They're just creating more chaos in, in, uh, in the country. And what we need to do, we need to be like, you know, our pets and, you know, show those that we come in contact with, you know, love and respect. And compassion. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're all different and we all have our individual pathway to, to walk. And, mm -hmm. you know, we got to, um, you know, help one another when we can, where we can. And, you know, especially, especially, you know, a word of kindness. Right. Oh, a my deed, goodness. That, a yeah. deed of kindness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because uh, that, that's one thing that's really missing. And little Sergeant Stubby, I mean, I just I just got the biggest kick out of reading about him, all his travels. He's a celebrity. He's marching in parades. He's he goes in, in front of three U.S. presidents. Well, Actually, and, it, I, and it didn't end. It, even after that, it went on even more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the truth be known, ladies and gentlemen, those presidents were they were trying to ride on his fame. <laughs> it wasn't little. It wasn't uh, Sergeant Stubby going up there to meet them because they were important. Oh, no, no. Th this dog's important. That's that's the way right. politicians are. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it's just amazing that, you know, in 18 uh, 1921, it was uh, he attended the Georgetown University Law Center along with the fellow who originally got him, uh, took him over with him, Conroy. And he became the Georgetown Hoyas team mascot. I mean, right. his fame just went on and on and on. And you think about someone playing on that team. Now, how can you give a, a, luck last, a lackluster you know, performance when this little dog has put it on the line, put his life on the line, put everything on the line, and you're too lazy to show up for practice? Are you kidding me? Right. <laughs> Well, what I got a kick out of was at halftime that the team would give him the football mm -hmm. and that little guy would go around and nudge that ball all around the field and oh, yeah. to amuse the fans. Mm. So, you know, again, he he wasn't, you know, even after the war, he was still giving his heart to everybody who saw or met him. Yeah. He was he knew he field. He knew Donna, he had that special gift to encourage people. And he had that special gift to be able to lighten people's loads. Right. And how many lessons can we learn from this little dog and all dogs? Hundreds. Especially, you know, yes, the list is endless. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. I mean, goodness, you know, like love and compassion, you know, showing someone love and compassion that yep. you care about them. You know, my goodness gracious. Uh that is something that, you know, we, we, this country is anemic mm -hmm. for brother for brotherly love. And I, when I say brother love, I mean mankind of men, women, all races, all that stuff. I mean, because, you know, the creator created each one of them exactly the way he wanted them to be. Right. Right. Well, I think one of the interesting things to note here, Jim, is that dogs do something um, well, they do most things better than humans, but one of the things that they do better that I think gives them the capacity to, to love more mm. is they listen. You know, that's true. That's true. I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the things that was very, that I picked up on, I've had several uh, Australian cattle dogs, blue healers, had one that was a red healer, and uh, we just lost him uh, here in November. He had uh, 
a, a chronic heart condition. And uh, but they watch your face when you enter a room. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I would do this just, you know, playing around because, you know, my warped sense of humor. I'd come in like, <coughs> and they kind of, well, we're going to give him some room. <laughs> but if I came in my normal self, you know, the way I'm normally am, and, you know, hey, how you doing? And, oh, they're just happy, 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 happy. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> um, if my sister's uh, listening in today, don't tell Evelyn I said this, but <laughs> sometimes <laughs> my dog was more happy to see me than she was. <laughs> <laughs> now I know no one out there can relate to that. <laughs> but you know, I think it's interesting that you know they they pick up not only uh, they listen with their ears, but they mm. but they really let's get down to it. They listen with their heart. Yeah, they listen and, with their heart, and they read body language like you cannot believe. Absolutely. They pick up on that. And uh, you like your story about, you know, how your dog would lay his head on your shoulder before you had a seizure. Mm -hmm. That has always baffled me how dogs can, you know, sense that their owner is going is, is shortly going going to have a problem. Right. Right. At yeah. first I thought, because my dog is not a lap dog. I mean, and you know, and I got to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of thankful for that at four feet long. He takes up the entire <laughs> side of the bed. So, 90 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really grateful for that. But it was really odd to me when th that whole journey of my, that part of my life was beginning that all mm -hmm. of a sudden a non lap dog would, you know, I'd be laying on the couch and I wasn't feeling well. And then all of a sudden, you know, here's a big old head laying on me. And I'm like, what in the world's going on? You know, because usually the only time he does that is when he's really scared or he's gotten in trouble. <laughs> he's gotten into something he shouldn't have. And then it's like, mommy, forgive me. I'm sorry. So mm. it took me about the second time I had a seizure for me to realize what he was doing. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one thing I've always wondered, uh, and I've said this many times about dogs, you work with them, you train them, you're patient with them, and you reward them when they do good things and kind of, you know, that, you know, kind of use a strong voice where they know that it wasn't, you know, they did not do right. But right. then you do that one little thing and they're inst instantly spoiled to it. They're kind of like, hey, this is the way the world was designed to turn there, Bubba. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and they're instantly spoiled. They're instantly yeah. spoiled. You know what I mean? That's a that's always, you know, I've always got a kick out of that because, you know, having dogs and being a dog lover and, and growing up with dogs all my life. And, you know, gosh, um, right now I don't have a dog. I got a kitty. And of course, you know, uh, dogs live with you. You live with cats. Okay. So I want to make that statement because, because <laughs> I got my little lover too. Oh yeah. My little girl, Dixie, we, she was a <laughs> we got her down at the animal shelter. She's a little kitten brought her home and I get up in the morning and if I don't get up early enough, usually I get up around four 30 or so, you know, I'm an early riser and uh, she'll come and get me and she'll yeah. walk on my side or on my stomach because it's, it's time right. for me to get up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I come into the kitchen and I'm getting ready to get my coffee going and she'll like start meowing at me. And that's her way of saying, OK, buddy, you can do your coffee a little later right now. I need a treat. So I right, give her right. a treat. That That's the pecking order. Mm -hmm. That's the pecking order. Well, I've and, always said that, that my animals, I, I never train them. They train me really well. Mm. <laughs> that that's about it yeah because uh i had a male siamese one time named alvin and he was really a cool cat he walked to the beat of his own drum and i tell you what <laughs> he was just uh you know he just he just kind of like look at me like yeah it's the old man yeah he, he's all right you know <laughs> but he walked you know just walked to the beat of his own drum and you think about all these animals how they have that capacity for their individual personality where does that oh, come yeah. from where does that come from for people that uh, believe that we evolved and things of this nature um uh, 
how does love evolve? Right. <laughs> Where does that come from? You know? Right. And, uh, and for dogs to be a big part of our lives and the way they help us in our hour of need, my goodness gracious. And there's people out there. And let me say this. Um, let me put our, e our email address up there, Donna. If they'd like to be a guest, you know, email us, uh, yeah. Inspiration E360 TV. But we're going to be doing some more of these little stories about dogs. The next show, I think we're going to do it. What was the name of that little dog over there in England or, or Scotland? Excuse me. A great was uh, Gray Friars Bobby. Gray Friars Bobby. Oh mm -hmm. my goodness, Gray! He sat at his owner's grave for fourteen years. Ah, uh, it, it, if that isn't love, I don't know what is. Right. I mean, you, you imagine that that little dog. But uh, you know, if you folks have a, an interesting dog story out there, in your dog that you know has done some extraordinary things like this, like these dogs have, let us know. We'll be glad. And, you know, we'll be yeah, yeah, because we we want to put some great stories out there because you know our dog dogs mean so much to us, and so many times we don't even stop, you know, to share you know, encouraging stories about dogs and think about all the lessons we can learn from dogs. My goodness Absolutely. gracious. Yeah. Do you remember, Jim, the the real bad fires in Australia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it was either, uh, forgive me if, it was either Australia or California. I can't remember which because they were kind of going at the same time. Mm -hmm. And anyway, there was a great Pyrenees and they're known, they're a herder. They're a herder dog. Mm -hmm. So they're a right. working dog. And uh, somebody's barn had caught fire from a wildfire and that dog went in and saved um, the animals and brought them out. And there was, um, of course, barn cats, right? You always have barn cats on a farm. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. yeah. You have to keep out, you know, keep the vermin down. So that that dog went in there and and mama had just had some kittens and went in and also saved the kittens. But that dog went and saved the, the sheep mm. and got burned, inhaled smoke. So, mm. you know, they are so incredibly brave and so oh. selfless. They are so selfless. And, you know, mm. I, you know, I feel blessed every day. Of, Jake will be 11 in April. And I am blessed every day to have this incredible journey with this mm. dog and learn from him and and grow with him and what mm. i have what i have learned from him is far more than he could probably ever learn from me oh yeah absolutely and you know to have that uh the sense that you know you number one you got a companion yeah because there's i remember reading a story one time there was a lady uh, she had gotten up in age and she had a little, I believe it was a poodle. I'm not sure, but a, a small dog. And uh, <laughs> the good for nothing family, the relatives, <laughs> they didn't have time for her while she was alive. So she left, as the story goes, and I read this many decades ago, but as the story goes, she left things set up for her little dog to live like royal royalty. And the family didn't hardly get anything, and they were all upset. <laughs> but the, th the thing was, was that who was there for that poor lady in her hour of need when she was lonely? Right. right. You know, when she was, you know, not feeling well, when she was suffering with her, with her um, ailments, whatever it might have been. And these people are, were, you know, they're, they were, you know, the family members were so interested in, you know, serving themselves and you know living life for themselves and didn't have time right. for her and then to get all mad and upset because <laughs> the poor little dog he's you know he's the he's the heir he got the lion's share yeah sure did because she wanted to make sure her little dog was taken care of because mm -hmm. she couldn't be there you know with him right but she wanted that little dog good well let's face it if they'll throw her out and ignore her they'd get, get rid of the dog too wouldn't he right Right. Well, I know, you know, even when my folks, uh, we had to put him in an assisted living home mm -hmm. and yeah, we searched to find an assisted living home that would take their dog. And it was a little uh, mentor snouser. And then mm. uh, my dad passed, what, two and a half months after I moved back. 
And then my mom uh, passed nine months later. And so uh, we still had Heidi and I unfortunately couldn't bring her home because Jake is uh, highly protective um, and it would work. Um, it just would not be a good scene. So anyway, um, one of my siblings had taken him, taken her and she didn't last that long. Be, you know, she got sick, but there was just no way that mom and dad were going to part with their with their best friend. Oh, yeah. You better believe it. And I love that story we were talking about before the show. Uh, was it your dad went in the military and the dog was who, who was the individual? I forgot. I apologize. Uh, well, my dad um, lied and, about his age and dropped out of school and went in the military, went in the army, started out in the army, ended up in the Air Force when he was 16. And he had a dog named Prince. It was a Springer. And Prince and dad had that really one in a lifetime connection. Right. And so dad went off. And back then you didn't come home after basic training. It was like a year later before you got home. And mm -hmm. during that time, Prince disappeared. And my grandpa finally wrote my dad and said, I don't know how to tell you this, but Prince disappeared. And about a week before my dad came home, Prince came home. Now, that, that's how does a dog know? OK, I better go back home because he he's coming home. I want to be there, too. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And no one knew where the dog was at for that no. year. huh? No, don't know if he no. was just running around and everybody knew my grandparents, you know, it was a real small town back in Montana. So oh my gosh, everybody, hmm. everybody knew my dad. Um, you know, it, back then Bozeman was super little. So oh, everybody, yeah. yeah, everybody knew everybody and oh, yeah. you, know, you knew the kids, you knew the animals. So they had no idea where he went. None. <laughs> Maybe went fishing, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, it's really amazing how animals can find their ways back over long distances too when they get separated from their family. Oh, yes. Ah, oh, goodness, how do they do that? I mean, do they have a? They got to have some type of a, a GPS, as we would call it. Built, right. Built they in. have. They have that homing device inside of them. Exactly. Yep. You got it. And it's always an inspiring story because it's always uh, I've, I've read a couple. I've seen several stories about that. You know, the family loses a dog on vacation or where they got to pack up and go and the dog can't come. And and then the dog takes, you know, quite a journey, a long right. ways to be able to get home. And, you know, because, you know, the family's all broken hearted when they have to leave the poor puck behind. But when he comes home, it's just plain joy and jubilee, you know. Right. It just it just goes back to, you know, our, our little sergeant stubby here. Oh, yeah. They have, they have that heart, that compassion. They give us hope and they give mm -hmm. us inspiration every mm -hmm. single day. Oh, yeah. You know, Donna, our time's almost gone. We th This has been a pretty fast hour, you know, talking about our, uh, our dogs and our loved ones. And goodness gracious. uh you know, what would our life be like if we didn't have dogs? Think about that. It would be I mean, much sadder. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, because some people, a dog, when they come home, that's the only love they have in a house. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, dogs are so, you know, they're just, you know, they just love you for who you are. Yep. I mean, you, you can. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, not to sound cruel or anything, but you can be as ugly as a box of rocks and a dog would like you and you know, love you, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's amazing how how much comfort they give us in our, <laughs> in our lives. I'm sorry. Me and my warped sense of humor. <laughs> you got me laughing now. <laughs> You're going to make me snort. <laughs> well, if you snort, I'm down for the count. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Don. I shouldn't have done that to you. I mean, you know, if you're not very attractive. <laughs> oh my gosh. You can see we have fun on this show, ladies and gentlemen. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> oh, I have tears in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you start 
Or did the laugh and then I'm, I'm sorry. But most important, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for that. Um, we do everything, you know, just off the cuff and we say what we think. And when we talk about the love our dogs have, my goodness gracious, and they do love us unconditionally. And we should have the same type of love unconditionally for our fellow man. And when I say man, I mean everyone we come in contact with, whether the male, female, black or white, all that stuff is physical, has nothing to do with the agape type of love, which comes straight from the heart. Matter. Yeah. And on behalf of Giggles over here <laughs> and myself, we're so glad that you're tuning in today. And we hope you have a wonderful. <laughs> Would you stop? <laughs> you're cracking me up, Donna. <laughs> anyway, you guys get the picture. We'll be back tomorrow. Same time, same place. We'll see you now. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you hope you have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.